Welcome to the Confluence Cast presented by Columbus Underground. We are a weekly Columbus centric podcast focusing on the civics, lifestyle, entertainment, and people of our city. I'm your host, Tim Fulton. This week, every piece is important. For Tom Krause, the outgoing CEO of Donato's Pizza, this tagline is more than just a catchphrase. With his departure coming up this fall, we sat down to talk about his journey at Donato's. We'll explore the key strategies behind their expansion, including the decision to focus on franchising and the early adoption of online ordering technology. Tom also shares his thoughts on the importance of building the right team, having strong leadership processes, and how these factors were crucial to their success. You can get more information on what we discussed today in the show notes for this episode at theconfluencecast.com. Enjoy the interview. Sitting down here with Tom Krause, the outgoing CEO of Donato's. Tom, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. Good. I'm doing well. We want to talk today basically about your tenure there, what's next, what you've seen in the, I think, 24 years, one month that you've been there. <laughs> Uh, so why are you leaving? First of all, so, you know, like you said, I've been with Donato's 24 years. We brought our, my replacement on, uh, about two and a half years ago. Okay. And, um, you know, succession planning is something you, you know, you really need to be thoughtful about Yeah. as a company. And we had a few people that had been in senior positions that we thought might be able to move into this role and that didn't work out. So we went back and said, who is the best person that we could possibly have? Right. And that's a guy named Kevin King. Well, you actually got, he was internal before or did did he start in 2021? No, he started with us. He started the franchise department back in 90 something, early nineties. Okay. And then left and went on to do some great things. And, we're like, well, he knows the company, he right. knows the culture of the company, he knows the family, yeah. which is important. It's still family-owned business, and he's had great experience on growing a brand. He really, he was like the perfect person. It was just probably more than we were, you know, shooting for originally. Okay, and so we convinced him. Actually, we convinced his wife. That was the first thing. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> and convinced him. Uh, to come and he's been here for you know two and a half years yeah and he's doing a great job and it's it's you know i've been ceo for almost 15 years that's that's like a generation that's probably long enough it's okay. time it's yeah. time for a new and you were the step. third and kevin will be the fourth is that right um, or you were the fourth ceo i yeah. think i was the i don't know let's see jim Two, three. I, th- I was the fourth. Okay. Kevin will be the fifth. Yeah. And so you made the decision a couple of years ago to do it. Yeah. What was the impetus for that? Well, you, you know. Did, basically, I did this for 25 years. It's time. Yeah. At some point, we needed to you know, put ourselves in the right spot. And, you know, honestly, I think a company needs fresh eyes mm-hmm. over a period of time. Not that I'm, I mean, I'm proud of everything that we've done while I've been here. But, you know, sometimes there's certain things you're not seeing. And I think it's important to bring some new people in. Now, the other thing I will tell you is it is a family owned business. We have our third generation that is working in the business. Okay. Uh, Jane's kids are in, you know, a potential line to, to take senior leadership at some point. So, you know, we, they're not quite ready yet. Right. So we need to make sure we've got somebody that has the characteristics that can help them. Yeah. You know, so it all kind of. And that diversity of experience from Kevin, he went out, worked for two different companies, but again, knew the business. Right. So talk about sort of the difference. Uh, This is your chance to gloat. Yes. (laughs) Uh, The, the expansion that you've done from the time of CEO to now. Yeah. 29 States now. Yeah. What were you in before? 12, 13. Okay. Like so talk about sort of, uh, that was an edict, I assume, from the family to say yeah. like, yeah, this needs to grow. Yes. You grow or die. Exactly. Right? How did you do that? What were you focused on? Well, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's some things that are maybe less sexy, but are super important. Like, yeah. Do you have the right team? 
Yeah. And when I say right team, it's not just do they, do they, are they great at what they do, but do they understand the culture? So, you, <clears throat> you know, you got to make sure you have the right team. Do you have the right process, like leadership process to be able to, to, um, accomplish the things that you want, you know, that you want to do. So we, we had to put the right people in place, right. Had to put the right process, which was simply, uh, staying really focused on the most important things that we need to do to grow. Cause, okay. Cause companies, we do it. Every company does. You get distracted, you start, you know, you, you have a plan, but then, you know, you think, well, I should move over here. And, and sometimes when and especially when you're a smaller company like ours, when you, when you're diffused in your efforts, you don't accomplish what you need to. So those are the kind of foundational, I call it boring things, but super important. The other, there were two big, probably pieces that the, the, the team accomplished. One was we made a decision. If we're going to grow, the best way to do that is through franchising mm-hmm. versus building company stores, do it through franchising generally you can move quicker because well number one it's the franchise partner's capital not our capital right so we don't it's easier to work with we don't have a billion money sometimes yeah exactly right. we don't have billions just laying around so um and probably more importantly if you're going into bowling green kentucky mm-hmm. you want to partner with somebody that really understands bowling green kentucky okay knows the market knows right. the market and the people and and, and you're just going to be a lot more successful. So we, had, we decided first we're going to grow through franchising. And then what do we need to do? Well, we need, you know, the franchise partners love our product. They love our culture. We needed to improve the cash return. That was the thing that was, and, and I'm not saying it was bad. It just wasn't super exciting. The, okay. the amount of profit that you can make from an as average, a partner, as a partner, as right. a franchisee, it it needed to be better so we we doubled the profitability of an average donatos over okay. that time period so once you do that your current partners want to grow people who i use partner because we call them franchise partners but yeah, yeah, yeah. they're basically franchisees potential franchisees who want to grow they talk to the existing partners they see that you know this is a it's not only a great product and great people but it's yeah. a good investment so but and you're your partners are mostly owning like dozens of stores. You know, it, it's there's kind of two groups. There's there's a, a couple of larger groups. Like mm-hmm. we have a group that owns most of Cincinnati. Okay, and um, we have a group that owns Indianapolis. But the rest are three stores. Oh, okay, I would say. yeah, three, okay, five store. Partners. And were you franchising when you started? You were because you said you doubled it. Yeah, right? we were franchising when I, when I started. I think we had ten franchisees. We have forty seven right now. So, Got it. And so uh, that was your focus. And talk sort of through the um, what was you were improving processes? I imagine. Yeah, processes. It, you know, top line was probably the biggest piece, like the the top line sales. Okay. And using technology, we we got very aggressive with online ordering. In fact, we were doing online ordering, I think, be, before anybody else was. Okay. Uh, and we've perfected that to the point that like ninety percent of our business is ordered uh, over the phone. Or, you know, over. Uh, Online or online, yeah. right? Yeah, laptop or phone. And so the technology, because I imagine one of the top line costs is labor, right? Like, and yeah. so the technology piece allows you to basic hire less people, have them focused on a, being a customer facing role. Like, that's the I, thinking I, there. Probably or? more so that it helped drive the top line without increasing a whole lot of costs. Got it. I mean, it is true that you don't have to schedule people to answer the phones. And they don't really want to answer the phones anyway because they're busy making pizzas. Right. And you can hear it in their voice. Like, <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> right. Um, so by going to, t- you know, but w- we didn't really cut labor. We just improved the top line and kept the labor the same. So, I mean, that's part of the, the profitability equation. Got it. And you guys also, was it a switch over to do the uh, the baking, the dough in-house, or was that always that the case? You know, I think... I think Jim's been making the dough at a central location. So we make it, it we have a plant yeah. in uh, Black Luck. 
Um, but I think he started that in 90, okay. you know, early nineties, if not before that. So, but we've, you know, grown it. And, and in terms it. of your, sorry to cut you off. No, no, no problem. In terms of your, uh, sort of your industry, what are the biggest changes that you've seen either in the franchising space and the pizza space specifically, like what's evolved? Talk specifically about the pandemic, maybe like what's different? Well, Definitely, uh, you know, the restaurant industry has changed dramatically because of, you know, the pandemic f- forced companies to learn how to bring food to people. Yeah, now, we've been doing it, doing it for a long time. Uh, it made us, it's making us better at it. I mean, the competition, frankly, is making us better. At okay, because it. It, it used to be the only people that delivered food, you know, was. Pizza was you guys in Chinese food? In Chinese right? food, pretty yeah. much. I think uh, KFC had d- dabbled in it a little bit, but that was it. Right. And now, you know, nobody thinks twice about you know we can have food delivered at home. So the competition is is greater. So the restaurant industry, I think, that part, third party delivery like DoorDash and Uber Eats, yeah, that you know has exploded. It's brought convenience to the customer. It's also brought you know, more expense to the customer. I mean, yeah. those deliveries are not cheap. Right. Um, and, you know, it's it's allowed some restaurants to expand their business who, you know, really was, they weren't thinking about right. delivery or off-premise. That's probably the biggest one. You know, health and nutrition continues to be, imp- you know, important. We, we've always, my, you know, my father-in-law started the company, has always been way ahead on, on eating trends. I mean, before I got there, he was one step ahead of it, everybody else. But, um, you know, it's, a, people have food allergies. It's important to have, you know, gluten free. We have two different gluten free options. Right. We, you know, we took trans fats out early on. So having clean labels and things like that. Okay. You know, that's more and more important. And I would say probably the other big change and this is true i think in all business is just a level of transparency between the customer and the and the brand or the company behind the brand okay you know it used to be uh it really wasn't talked about like who is this company and what do they stand for okay customers didn't really care back yeah you know but yeah corporate personhood like People are gonna. Where do you stand on this thing? Right. You know, and and I come into I come into work for Donato's, and I'm talking to Jim, and he's you know he has all these. Uh, some might say corny sayings like "treat others the way you'd like to be treated" or okay. do, "do the right thing." Right. And, but you know, I'm listening and I'm watching this company, and I go, "This is this is really what Donato stands for. It right. is all about that." And I told Jim, I said, Jim, he goes. And he, he never liked to accept awards and things like that. Okay. He's like, that's, that's bragging. I go, you could call it bragging, but I, I people want to know what kind of company. We yeah. <laughs> Is it like, I feel better buying I feel a better pizza from somebody from I like. Somebody I like and know. That, right. You know, I and mean, it that, supports their people. I mean, and that's huge. And with social media, it's like, you can't, you, you really can't hide behind some, you know, yeah. fake thing. I mean, I suppose some people do, but talk about your involvement in the community. You're a member of a couple of boards. Yeah, I'm on the uh, board of Kappa. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I'm on the board of Music Columbus. Mm-hmm. I used to be on the board of uh, Harmony Project. I used to be on the board of Junior Achievement. But yeah, I, I'm I'm interested in in music and arts culture in Columbus. You're your songwriter yourself. I am. You before we started recording, you have a song that a lot of people hear sometimes. <laughs> it, it's the funniest darn thing. Yeah, no, I wrote a song called "The Hot Dog Boy." <laughs> <laughs> my my eight year old son at the time, he's twenty four now, but he had an idea for a business that had these like you know gourmet pimped up hot dogs that okay they'd change depending on the season or the holiday and okay so i started calling him hot dog boy and it <laughs> made sense to write a song called hot dog boy and uh it turns out the columbus clippers have picked it up and they play it every home game yeah for the hot dog race <laughs> yeah and full disclosure we both root for mustard oh f- of sure. course <laughs> i mean should we even talk about this no yeah absolutely exactly not. <laughs> 
talk about sort of changes you've seen in Columbus. It's it's evolved certainly in the time that you've been here. And sorry, you we didn't say it earlier. You worked for Wendy's for 13 years before yeah. that. You're an Ohio State graduate. Mm-hmm. Um, sort of talk about what where'd you grow up? Sorry, I don't know that. I, I grew up in Columbus in Upper Arlington. Oh, okay. I, I was born in Bowling Green, Ohio. Moved down here with uh, my family when I was young. Got so. it. Got it. Talk sort of about the the business climate in Columbus and what you've seen change. Oh man, it's, it, I tell you the thing, and it's probably talked about a lot, but it is true and it's different because I've had exposure to, to other communities that yeah. the, the, the collaborative nature of this community is unique. I mean, it is businesses helping one another, you know, we, even within our category, we will tend to help other pizza players. And, you know, that, that's our competition. But, you know, if you think about it, if people like pizza and pizza is regarded as a positive thing, it's good for everybody. Right. But you don't see that in a lot of other communities. Um, I, I, you know, when Columbus was awarded the Smart Business. Smart City Grant. Smart yeah. City Grant. <clears throat> I think that was a, kind of a big step for us to look at things differently. Like, mm-hmm. what is it to be a great city? And something like that, which you know levels up all technology. It levels, up, but the way the community came together for that grant and what you know Alex and Jordan and those did mm-hmm. to help that. So that I, I kind of look at that as a model for the cultural arts. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I want to see that with music and and because I think, you know, it's great to be a smart city, but it's probably as important. Maybe you could make a case even more important to be a creative city. Absolutely. How do you solve problems? How do you how do you, you know, deal with rapid change, things like that? You know, I, th- yeah. I think creativity is really. Po- but we have a great creative community. I'd like to see a, a tighter infrastructure between the different arts and things like that. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, GCA, D, G, GCAC does an amazing job, but I think we all need to kind of pull together. So. Yeah, but I mean, I think that, first of all, yes, yeah. GCAC does a fantastic job yeah. uh, with uh, all manner of things, especially distributing grants and that sort of thing. But I do see absolutely sort of a, a segmentation mm-hmm. of like, there's a difference between, uh, and, and there's always going to be, right? The symphony, the ballet, and then when you get down to individual artists and, you know, I've all, one critique that I've had of the uh, arts festival, and I realize now it kind of has to be that way, but there's not a lot of Columbus representation in it because these people are touring the country and doing arts festivals. Yeah, I, I, think, I think all this is changing. I really do. I think, in fact... The arts festival, all the music this year was all from Columbus. Yes, all of it was from Columbus, and I think you're seeing conversations between the symphony and the opera mm-hmm. and music Columbus. We're, music Columbus, we're hoping that we can help facilitate conversations that allow us to kind of take it to that ne- next level. But, but there is, you know, you've got to have infrastructure, and you know, there's a lot of creative musicians from Columbus that, you know, their all of their economy goes outside of Columbus. Yeah. How do we keep that in, in Columbus? So. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you see back to Donato's? Yeah. What do you see as basically Kevin's next big job when you're gone in October? Um, just don't screw it up. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> keep it for the kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> You know, I think growing it, and and I think the way to grow that is it's kind of like patting your head and rubbing your belly a little bit. The, mm-hmm. the rubbing your belly part is how do we make sure that Donat an, an average Donato's experience is the best that it possibly can be. I mm-hmm. mean, it sounds like fundamentals because it is, but how can we, how can our service be uh, as reputable as our product reputation? Mm-hmm. You know, how do we do that? And then at the same time, be very open to growth. And growth means, you know, we're, we're opening in, te- we're going to open three stores in Texas this year. Okay. So it's literal growth across the country and growth in terms of being open to new, new thinking, technology and innovation. We're, 
we're working with um, the Edge Innovation Center that's run by my father-in-law and mm-hmm. my brother-in-law, Tom Grody, and, and Jim, his dad. And they are working on automation and technology that's going to make it better for actually all restaurants, pizza uh, specifically and even more specifically us. Okay. So looking, you know, so fundamentals over here, but you know, a growth mindset and a, and a mindset for technology over here. And, and we're set up for it. We've got a great team. Um, we're in, you know, we're f- fully resourced. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess the thing I think about is sort of, is there a, a, a point that you can't expand beyond right now? Like in terms of, you know, the baking, the dough, everything, like- you know, not really that, <laughs> Yeah, I sound like I'm sucking up to my father-in-law, but it is <laughs> it is true. He built a system that it, it's unique. And when I talk about system, I mean how the, the, the dough comes in. So we don't mix flour in the s- store. We don't right. need the dough. And that's fine, and that, that that's great for an artisan where you're really paying attention to it. Right. But if you're not paying attention to it, you might get dough that rises one day and doesn't rise the next day. You might get burned in a coal fire oven on the edge one day and not the next day. And so if you want a consistent product, we vertically integrated. So the dough comes to the restaurant. Right. The way the product is, is uh, you know, the toppings are weighed to a hundredth of a pound. We, we bake it. You know, it, it will only bake the right amount of time at the right temperature. That All of that... Jim kind of devised all that, and it has super high capacity. We have the average pizza place in America does, I want to say, eight hundred fifty thousand dollars a year in sales. Okay, and we have restaurants that are close to three million oh. right now. So okay, the, the, now it's not our average, but right. So the upside, you know, but you the, are built to scale. Is we what are you're built saying. To like scale. there's not like. I, for a very short period of time, owned a kitchen in the back of a bar. Yep. And we were expanding, went to investors. And the first smart question that I had never thought of <laughs> was, okay, how many can you make in an hour? Right. And I was like, oh, uh, I'm going to have to get back to you on that. Right. Yeah. We've got it. We've got a really great platform. I, I think the bottleneck really is labor. I mean, that's okay. the bottleneck. If we don't have enough drivers on staff, if we don't have enough people, um, you know, scheduled or people call off and, you know, that whole, the labor market's changing so much. And yeah. We're, you know, we're trying to keep up with the changes cause it's just different. Do you think I'm just, this is yeah. very minor side note. Do you see it going to a thing where like I order Chipotle on the Chipotle app, but I mm-hmm. know darn well that that delivery is not being facilitated by them. Right. right? That it's being handled by DoorDash. We, you know, we, we have a percentage of our deliveries are delivered by DoorDash. So back to the point, okay. like, is there a capacity? So on nights, let's say, cause 40 some percent of our sales come on Friday and Saturday night. So okay. that's a lot. Yeah. So, and then on top of that, let's say, um, you know, in the winter, let's say a little snowstorm pops up yeah. and everybody says, I'm staying home. I'm ordering pizza. The demand goes way high. Yeah. And we're not staffed for it. We have a little uh, lever that switches, and DoorDash can help augment our drivers okay. for delivery. So, so you're able to just sort of we're flip able to that flip switch. the switch. Okay. So, you know, it's it'll be interesting to see how all that shakes out over the next few years. Because you know, I'm not sure those companies have settled on what their yeah you know economic model is. You know, they're still kind of buy-in market share. Oh yeah. And then once you get past that, yes. it's like, what's the world going to look like? I don't know. So, yeah. Well, and where does that cost lie, right? Right. And does it go back to the customer? Obviously, it's cheaper to buy directly from you than it is for me to buy Donato's from DoorDash, yes, right? Yes, it is. Uh, but yeah, if you have to flip that so, switch. So we're trying to remain flexible. Like, you know, when, the, when Uber Eats first came to Columbus, there was no delivery company that was signing up with them. It was everybody else. And we signed up right away. Okay. People are like, well, why did you do that? I'm like, I want to learn. You know? Yeah. The devil you know is better than the <laughs> devil you don't know. So, and that's turned into actually a pretty good partnership with DoorDash. So, Got it. I mean, it's not without its, 
bumps and they're not perfect, but we're not perfect either. Everybody's trying to keep up with demand. You know, customer service is, is a challenge in yeah. today's day, day and age. It really is. How do you, I'm just curious how much you sort of manage your franchisees. Like, do you manage their relationship with DoorDash? They get to make those choices on their own or? They, they make those choices. Got yeah. it. Just curious. Yeah. What's next for you? Gosh, you know, it's a hard question. So I, I hired a uh, coach. Okay. Who's special. Actually, her name's Carol Watkins. She used to be with Cardinal Health, and she started a little business that helps cats like me who have jobs like mine to retire or transition or whatever. Cause, yeah. Because some people don't do a, a good job either. And it's specifically that, or is it all executive coaching? No, it's it's it's, it's pretty much focused on Got it. a transition in your career to to. I mean, retirement's not exactly the right word for it because I'm not going to just go home and play shuffleboard or. Right. You know, I love my grandchildren, but it's not. That's not the reason I'm retiring. Right. So, uh, <laughs> I'll have more time. So anyway, her directive is don't make any don't say yes to anything for six months so okay now i will tell you i'm on the board of the international franchise association i'll stay there yeah i'm interviewing on for a couple other board positions so i, I would like board positions yeah I assume. yeah and i'd like to be able to help companies you know I, I mean i i've been around a while and i think i could bring some you know, some good thoughts. And so if I could do that and, and kind of accelerate what they're trying to do, I'd, I'd like to do that. And then I'm going to play a lot more music. Okay. So, yeah. We've got, got a, a couple of bands going right now and, and I'm actually finishing a record next week. There you go. I'm putting out. So, all right. Yep. I end every interview with the same two questions. Uh oh. What do you think Columbus is doing well? And what do you think Columbus is not doing so well? I think what Columbus is doing well is is collaborating mm -hmm. and when there's issues coming together. I think what Columbus needs to do a better job of is really deal with some of the more difficult uh you know poverty issues mm -hmm. that fold over into educational challenges, you know, our our graduation rates and our kindergarten readiness is it's not anything to be proud of mm -hmm. and it, it, I'm, it's a difficult challenge, but we, we have got to get ahead of that because our, the children are the future and we can talk all we want about being a smart city or creative city or collaborative city. And if we're not preparing, pe you know, young people, we'll, we'll be in trouble. So absolutely. Yeah. Tom, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Confluence Cast presented by Columbus Underground. Again, you get more information on what we discussed today in the show notes for this episode at theconfluencecast.com. Please rate, subscribe, share this episode of the Confluence Cast with your friends, family, contacts, enemies, your favorite pizza maker. If you're interested in sponsoring the Confluence Cast, get in touch with us. We can be reached by email at info at theconfluencecast.com. Our theme music was composed by Benji Robinson. Our producer is Philip Cogley. I'm your host, Tim Fulton. Have a great week.